So it's a great pleasure to have Professor Mark Kamionkowski uh, from uh, Physics and Astronomy Department of Johns Hopkins University. Uh, everybody knows that Mark worked in different, different areas, including particle physics, particularly dark matter, inflation, CMB, gravitational waves, and many more. And uh, I'm not going to give a very big uh, introduction to Mark because uh, his work actually uh, telling that he's uh, like working on different different branches in uh, theoretical physics. Particularly, I just want to mention that um, uh, like uh, today he's uh, going to talk about a very serious topic in cosmology uh, these days, which is called the Hubble tension. And uh, uh, Mark for uh, you, this is uh, like this is the thirty-second QASTM seminar uh, series, and uh, we are very, very happy to welcome you uh, virtually from Max Planck Potsdam, and very happy to have you in our forum. And uh, thank you very much for your time and for this talk. So, Mark, you can please start. Uh, and because like this is a very serious issue, Hubble tension. Uh, so I hope we are going to learn a lot of things from this talk. Thank you. Okay, let's go. So please chime in with questions. I'll begin with an apology. Um, I've had limited time to prepare slides recently. And so the uh, PowerPoint is slightly less polished than it probably should be. Um, but uh, my brain still functioning, I believe. And um, so please interrupt with questions if you have them. I think uh, that always makes the talk, I think, more valuable for everybody involved. If there's something that's confusing to you or something that uh, seems like that you'd be interested to know, chances are there are other people who might also be interested to know. <clears throat> so um, I'll be telling you about the Hubble tension and um, this is work that I've been, something I've been thinking about since 2016. I wrote a first paper with Tan V. Karwal, who was a postdoc here, sorry, a graduate student here. She's now a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, two years later, in the fall of 2018, I completed a second paper with Vivian Poulin, who was at the time a postdoc um, at Johns Hopkins, and Tan V, who's still a student, and um, Tristan Smith, who's an assistant professor at Swarthmore College, who was spending a sabbatical at Johns Hopkins at the time. And um, that work has received quite a bit of attention. A lot of people have been thinking about similar things over the past few years. And um, there's also another, another paper I'll tell you briefly about that was done with Vivian Poulin, Kim Body, who was a postdoc, just moved to Texas for a faculty position and um, Simeon Bird, who was a, was a professor at UC Riverside. So, um, we'll start with the Hubble Law. So this is a knowledgeable audience, so I won't spend a whole lot of time on this. Um, observationally, we see that when we look at galaxies, they are moving away from us with some velocity. And if we can estimate their distance, then we can infer the expansion rate of the universe, H. Um, also written as H naught, because strictly speaking, when we measure the expansion rate in this way, um, as the um, constant of proportionality between the velocity and the distance, um, it gives us the expansion rate of the universe today. So the subscript zero denotes the value today. And I'm not going to go through the measurements in detail, but as you've probably heard, um, there are measurements of the Hubble parameter that come from type 1a supernovae. Type 1a supernovae are believed to be standard candles. Um, they have been ascertained to be standard candles to the degree possible. Um, 
and they are um, observed uh, to if, give you a value of a Hubble constant, which I will show you in a bit, which is about 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec. I'll come back to that soon. Um, I won't say too much else about the measurements, except to say that there are other measurements, um, say from gravitational lensing, that have given similar values. There's also a recent value from, um, from large-scale structure that gives a similar value in the mid, you know, lower 70s. Um, I don't think that those are quite as robust or well supernova distances. The supernova measurements are fairly straightforward. Um, and they give you a value of a Hubble constant in this very straightforward way. We also infer a value of a Hubble constant from the cosmic microwave background. So as you know, WMAP and Planck and ACT and SPT and a variety of other experiments have provided very precise and detailed maps of the cosmic microwave background temperature. This is a picture, I think, from WMAP or Planck. I don't even know. You can't tell the difference given the resolution of this image. Um, they're hot and cold spots. Um, there is no particular structure in here that's obvious, but in Fourier space, there is structure. There are correlations, and although it is a random map, it is a random map specified by a very um, specific pattern of correlations. And roughly speaking, again, I'm not going to go into the details because I'm going to focus more on theory than on measurement. Um, there are um, hot spots, sorry, hot spots and cold spots. And there is a characteristic size to these hot and cold spots, which is roughly a degree. And that statement can be quantified much more precisely. And when we look at this cosmic microwave background, we are looking at the universe as it was roughly 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And we are seeing a spherical surface in the early universe. And we're seeing a spherical surface in the early universe as it was roughly 400,000 years after the Big Bang. These little squiggly lines are my attempt to draw galaxies. Um, the universe is transparent after 400,000 years, and so the light emitted from this surface of last scatter propagates to us um, um, uh, in the straight lines and undeflected. Uh, so this is how we infer the Hubble parameter from the cosmic microwave background. Again, this is a sort of simplified explanation, but it's um, important for the theory that we're going to do later to have this basic picture in mind. So what we do to infer the um, Hubble parameter is as follows. We look at this cosmic microwave background. Given the values of cosmological parameters and the standard cosmological model, we can infer the distance to the surface of last scatter. Um, we see the angular size of these hot and cold spots. Um, when we measure that to be roughly one degree, although strictly speaking, the measurement is the most precise of, the, of theta sub s, so this um, angular size is the most precise um, value that you can infer from the cosmic microwave background, and that is constrained to roughly one part in 10,000. And if we know the physics responsible for these hot and cold spots, and we believe that their sizes are dictated by the size of the sound horizon at the surface of last scatter, then we infer the Hubble constant. So the Hubble constant turns out to be um, one over the proportional to one over the angular diameter distance. And that turns out to be determined experimentally by this very well measured angular diameter um, sorry, this um, very, very well-measured angle, which is um, one degree, but it's determined to a one part in 10 to the fourth. And we then divide by the sound horizon that we get by modeling the physics in the early universe for assumed or measured values of the parameters like the cosmic, cosmological parameters like the variant density, the matter density, et cetera. So that is how we get the Hubble parameter from the cosmic microwave background. Um, when we do things more carefully, what we actually do is take this map. I have a question. Yep. So uh, this uh, value at uh, like CMB of the Hubble parameter, uh -huh. is it actually determined or it is like given? It's inferred. Okay. So it the is Hubble parameter is inferred from the measurements. Oh, okay. So strictly speaking, what we do is we take this map. 
We infer, we obtain from it the power spectrum, which is essentially a, a Fourier transform. Uh -huh. um, and then we have a measurement of this power spectrum, and then we have cosmological models, um, in particular the standard lambda CDM model, mm -hmm. um, which is a six, actually a five parameter model. Well, yes. Parameter depending on the account. There's the cosmological constant, the baryon density, um, the scalar spectral index, the um, scalar amplitude, mm -hmm. and um, the matter density. Mm -hmm. And we then fit um, for the values of those five six parameter measurements. And the value of the Hubble parameter that comes out is something I'll show you in a second, which is in the high 60s rather than the low 70s. Okay. Um, but Although, you know, people often just talk about it as a, you know, a black box, the physics that I want you to keep in mind when we talk about theory is essentially this. We take the very well measured um, angular scale, theta sub s, and divide it by the um, sound horizon that we obtain from the measurements of the cosmological parameters and the, cosmo um, and the cosmological model. And by comparing those two, we obtain the Hubble parameter. So when this is done, what we find is that the cosmic microwave background gives us a value of the Hubble parameter of 67.4 with reasonably small error bars. Um, this is actually the CMB measurement. There's an analogous measurement that can come from baryon acoustic oscillations, um, which have a similar sound horizon imprinted in the angle in the in the galaxy distribution. I won't talk about that so much. But this early universe value inferred from the cosmic microwave background um, differs from values obtained um, from by you know comparing the velocity recessional velocities of galaxies with their distances. And that gives us a value closer to 74. And the important thing is that the discrepancy between this result over here and this result over here is now more than three sigma. It's actually closer now to more than five sigma. So this is a statistically significant, statistically a very significant discrepancy between these supernova measurements and this CMB measurement. There are other measurements that come from gravitational lensing um, that give you similar results, but um, I would say that these uh, measurements are not quite yet as well understood. So that is the Hubble tension. Why is it that the locally inferred cosmo um, expansion rate differs from that inferred from the CMB by quite a bit? And it's important to note that the CMB inferred value is lower than the, that inferred from supernovae. And that turns out to make things uh, more complicated. As we will see, if it was the other way around, it'd be a very easy thing to resolve. So this is the Hubble tension. Um, we put it in quotation marks because this term, Hubble tension, was inferred four or five years ago when it was a two sigma result. Um, but now it's actually you know, closer to five sigma or so. And so that is a bona fide discrepancy. And so what we should, what we call the Hubble tension should really be called a Hubble discrepancy. And the question is, why does the expansion rate inferred from the CMB differ from that observed locally? So there are three at least three possible explanations. One is that it's a problem with the local measurements. Another is that it's a problem with the CMB measurements or the interpretation of those CMB measurements. Um, a third is that both of the measurements are wrong. <laughs> um, but another possible explanation is new physics, which is what I'm gonna focus my efforts on. I'm not gonna talk about the measurements. I'm not an observer, I'm not an experimentalist. Um, I will, however, say that many, um, since this is such an important result, the me local measurements and the CMB measurements have been scrutinized by a number of people who are far more qualified to scrutinize them than I have. And nobody has been able to find anything that is obviously wrong with the measurements or obviously incorrect with their interpretation. And the only thing I'm gonna show you about the measurements is this um, email message I actually got from Adam Reese last week about something else. Um, so Adam Reese, as you know, got a Nobel Prize for discovering the accelerated cosmic expansion back in 1998. Um, and he has been behind the measurements of the supernova value for the Hubble constant. And 
He says, I keep reminiscing about how similar and different this is to 1998. I find the measurement side probably stronger than then. So he actually says that he has more confidence in the measurements now than he did back in 1998 when they announced the discovery of the cosmological constant. So, so can I ask a question? Just or uh, yeah. So, yeah, so just a sociological one. So I guess there are different problems in cosmology. There's a lithium-7 problem, Lowell anomalies in CMB, and the statistical significance of those is also very high. But it seems more attention is given to the Hubble uh, tension than those. So how do you rate the Hubble tension problem uh, vis a vis these other two problems in cosmology? That's a good question. Um, so the low L problem. So you're talking about the, the low power at small L? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's, I've, I've thought quite a bit about that problem as well. Um, the issue there is that it's an anomaly, it's, it's statistically significant or not depending on what question you ask. And it's, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a discrepancy between two different measurements. Um, it's a discrepancy with the standard prediction of a standard, you know, cosmological model, um, depending on the question you ask. You know, if you say, I have a cosmological model that predicts that the quadrupole should be this value, it's observed to be this value, then it sounds like, a, then it's statistically significant. But if I say I have, you know, 10 um, low L multiples, you know, from L equals two to 11, and I have a prediction for the values, I predict that you know, their values should be this, distributed with some Gaussian distribution about a mean, then having one of them that's low is not such a big deal. So it depends what question you ask, and if you have a model that predicts um, a low quadrupole and that everything else is the same, then that, could be that measurement could be construed as evidence for that model, but it's a little tricky. Um, what was the other discrepancy you measured? Lithium-7 problem in Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. I think oh. that has been around since 1980s, if I recall. Yeah, I have no idea what to make of that. Um, I mean, that's complicated astrophysics, and um, I think the issue is very few people. It's, it's, it's complicated astrophysics, and aren't that many people equipped to fully understand it. I don't, I don't know that I would rate this more or less significant than that. It's just, uh, this is an anomaly and uh, we had some ideas about, you know, about it. Um, the other thing's an anomaly, but I don't know that anyone's had any very clean and obvious ideas about it. So I think those are other, those are also interesting questions, but I don't, I don't want to rate. Okay, thank you. So also should we just ask questions by interacting or should we raise our hands and then one of you will look? I just want to know the mode the, or either way is fine. For me, I'll just say jump in because I can't okay, see. Okay, fine. It. Okay, fine, fine. Okay. Also, be nice if you identify yourself so I know who's asking the question. Yeah, this is Shantanu Desai. Thank you. Okay. Nice to meet you. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Okay. So, where are we? So there have been a huge number of solutions proposed to the Hubble tension. And um, roughly speaking, they can be classified into early time solutions and late time solutions. And the basic idea is that this theta sub s is fixed very precisely. Um, and if we want to try to increase the Hubble value of the Hubble parameter inferred from the CMB, then either the, uh, either the angular diameter distance, the distance to the surface of last scatter, has to be larger, sorry, larger, yes, large, no, no, smaller. The, the, the distance to the surface of last scatter has to be, hold on, I want to increase this, and therefore I want to decrease this, yes. So the co-moving distance to the surface of last scatter either has to be smaller or, you know what? I've got something backwards here, don't I? Theta is R divided by dA. No, oh, that's fine. So either, yeah, either the angular diameter distance to the surface of last scatter 
is smaller or the um, sound horizon is larger, sorry, smaller than in the standard cosmological model. So if I try to change the angular diameter distance to the surface of last scatter, that's gonna involve some new physics at late times between the time the photons were emitted and observed. Or if I want to change the sound horizon, then that would be an early time solution because I would be somehow modifying the expanse and history of early universe physics so that R sub s, the physical size of these hot and cold spots would be a bit smaller. So those are the two possibilities. So uh, the late I, time, uh, yeah. May, may I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, the theta is pretty well constrained. Uh -huh. It means uh, it's, uh, it should not be just either, it should be both, right? Uh, if, if you want to decrease uh, the angular diameter distance, you also have to decrease uh, the sound horizon, both of them, right? So that you don't play with the, don't change theta much. Yeah, I'm realizing as I look at the slide that the, the, um, I'm realizing as I look at the slide that um, this is not a good equation. It's, it's a rough equation, but it's not um, a good equation. What I actually want to write is um, the actual expression for the angular diameter distance, which I have here, roughly speaking. And I have a more precise um, formula on the next page. So basically, um, the angular diameter distance so when we calculate the angular diameter distance, I actually should have put it in here. The angular diameter distance to a given redshift. So here this redshift of interest is going to be 1100, the redshift of the surface of last scatter. Um, strictly speaking, this 100 should be taken out of the integral. And this, strictly speaking, this um, is H naught. So strictly speaking, this is H naught to the minus one divided by one plus the star times this integral. And if I want to make H naught larger to increase, to agree with the supernova distance, then this integral has to be decreased. So it's the value of this integral that I'd want to decrease in order to account for the Hubble tension. Okay. So, Roughly speaking, this, what I want to do is decrease the um, expansion rate at some point during the late history of the universe. In other words, I want to somehow decrease the expansion rate relative to what it is in the standard lambda CDM model um, at redshifts between zero, between, at times between now and the surface of last scatter. Now, Again, I'm not going to go through these early, these late, these late time solutions, but what these late time solutions roughly require is that um, H of T be decreased, but the expansion rate is determined um, in the standard cosmological model um, by the square root of the energy density of the universe at any given time. And so if we want to decrease H, we have to somehow decrease the energy density relative to that in the standard model. And this is hard to imagine because there's a certain amount of matter in the universe today. And, um, you know, the matter density is whatever the matter density is, the radiation density is whatever it is. There's a cosmological constant. Um, and it's conceivable, you know, like in a quintessence model, for example, that the energy density could have been larger um, at earlier times than it is today. But um, it's not conceivable that the value of the cosmological constant could have been smaller at earlier times than it is today, unless we had um, a, an equation of state parameter W less than minus one, which violates various, you know, violates the strong energy condition. So it is possible to change rho, you know, change the standard cosmological model so that the energy density is smaller um, at these intermediate redshifts, but it's, involves some fairly, you know, violation of some, um, you know, energy principles that are taken kind of seriously. Um, this is actually a slide that attempts to illustrate this. This is um, from a paper by Vivian Foulain and Kim Body and Simeon Bird and me um, from 2018. 
And what we did is we actually just um, allowed this dark energy, um, energy density, the cosmological constant energy density to be an arbitrary function of redshift. And what we found is that in order to solve the Hubble tension, the model actually um, required a negative energy density at some intermediate redshift, which makes no sense. So, I mean, if you have some way of having negative energy density, then you can solve the Hubble tension. Um, and there's another paper by Zhao et al. that attempts to describe this in a similar way. Instead of parameterizing this dark energy density in terms of its energy density, they parameterize it in terms of its equation of state parameter. So if you have an equation of state parameter that's less than minus one, then you can solve all the Hubble tension. Um, now I should say that, you know, even if you're willing to entertain such crazy theoretical ideas, and clearly we were willing to entertain such crazy theoretical ideas, it turns out that these solutions don't work, um, not just because of theory, but also because of experiments. And it boils down to this. Um, there are similar imprints of the sound horizon observed in the galaxy distribution at later redshifts. And if you try to solve the, explain the Hubble tension, if you try to increase the value of the Hubble parameter from the cosmic, inferred from the cosmic microwave background in this way, um, you still run into tensions with this galaxy survey measurement. And so these late time solutions really don't work. They involve wacky theoretical physics, but even if you're willing to um, accept that wacky theoretical physics, um, it, uh, the, the models are constrained observationally. Can I ask a question? Yep. Uh, this is Elisa, by the way, Elisa Ferrer. Mm -hmm. um, did you have to assume, did you assume uh, anything about the equation of state, like a CPL parameterization for this result? No, this was a, this was a truly wacky paper. Well, no, the paper was a great paper. <laughs> um, and actually we did a, a variety of things in this paper, but there's one section in the paper where we said, let's just try to fit for this energy density as a function of redshift. So, you know, we broke out the redshift range between now and the surface of last scatter into several different bins. Um, the bins aren't shown here. Um, so we, you know, had, you know, separated into, you know, five or six different redshift bins. And then we did um, an MCMC -MC analysis to figure out what was the best fit. Um, reg energy density is a function of redshift um, that gives you the supernova value of the Hubble constant. Oh, I see. So you reconstructed the. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And what we found the reconstruction gives you negative energy densities. Okay, so since we're talking about vacuum models, okay, what about like non-lambda CDM models like RH is equal to CT and rolling costing cosmologies and others? I mean, would that solve this problem? I mean, I know those models have other problems, but would they solve this problem? This is Shantanu again. Um, if you try, if you work out those, um, where is it? Um, they they all, the, prob, the, the real problem is that those late time solutions wind up being in conflict with the Baryon acoustic oscillation measurement. So all of those different models that you're talking about um, essentially boil down to the same thing over here. The, you have some way of parameterizing um, an expansion history, either in terms of an energy density or an equation of state parameter, um, but they all wind up giving you the same, they, they all wind up running to the same problem with the Baryon acoustic oscillation. Yeah, but is the Baryon acoustic oscillation result truly model independent or is there some sort of circularity about the Lambda CDA model itself in built? I mean, that's... Uh, well, I think we'll get to that hopefully in the next... Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, I mean, the, the assumption with all these models is that you're introducing some new physics to simply change the late time expansion history. And any model that does nothing but that that's any model whose effects are manifest simply in the late time expansion history um, want um, run into these problems with the varying acoustic oscillations. Uh, so the alternative is early, well, one alternative is to change the early time expansion history 
in an effort to change um, the sound horizon. So all of these late time solutions assume that the early universe physics is the same, and so that the physical sound horizon is the same. But if we could somehow change the early universe first physics to um, decrease the sound horizon, then we would solve the Hubble tension. So this is fairly straightforward to say in words. And it is also fairly straightforward to come up with a physical model that does that. So what we do, and this was um, work originally with Tanvi Carwall in 2016, and then we expanded with Vivian Dulan and Tristan Smith in 2018. So if we simply, simply postulate some new component of, of matter, and, you know, so we call early dark energy, um, that behaves like a cosmological constant. So this is the energy density of the universe as a function of redshift. And the blue is the radiation, the yellow is the non-relativistic matter, the red is the total. Hold on. Sorry, I need to answer this. Hello? Uh-huh. Okay, sorry about that. One of the problems about working from home. Uh, so anyway, we have the total energy density is this red curve over here. And um, what we postulate, and the cosmological constant is the green curve over here. And what we postulate is some new type of matter or energy density that behaves like a cosmological constant at early times. Um, but then at some redshift around the time of matter radiation equality decays faster than radiation or matter. And we call this early dark energy. And if we postulate something that looks like this, then as a fraction of the total energy density, it will look like this. So the very early expansion history of the universe, you know, Big Bang nucleosynthesis and earlier would be unaffected by this early dark energy. Um, the late expansion history of the universe, so the universe since recombination um, would look exactly like it does in the standard cosmological model. And the only thing that would happen is that the expansion rate would be increased by about 10% at redshift somewhere around 10,000 to 100,000. So that is the postulate. Now the reason we postulate this is that if the expansion history if um, the expansion rate, if the energy density is increased um, at these redshifts, then um, according to the Einstein equation, the expansion rate is also increased at these, at these redshifts. And if the expansion rate is increased, then the time it takes to get to the redshift of recombination is decreased. And the amount of time that a sound wave has to propagate um, before recombination is decreased, and so the sound horizon is decreased. So that's all we do. We simply postulate some extra energy density, so the expansion rate is increased by about 10% before recombination, and then the um, sound horizon is decreased by about 10%. And if the sound horizon is decreased by about 10%, then um, the Hubble constant that you, that you infer from the cosmic microwave background is increased by about 10%. So that's all there is to it. Now, the problem is that um, the measurements of the CMB power spectra, the temperature and polarization power spectra, are very, very precise now. And so um, you actually have to construct a physical model. If you actually want to see if this works, you have to construct a physical model for this really dark energy. Um, you have to specify the physics, and then you have to also consider the growth of perturbations in this energy, dark energy density, and figure out how the growth of those perturbations, as well as this change to the expansion history, 
affects the detailed prediction for the CMB power spectra. So um, there are two postulates that we proposed um, in this paper a few years ago. So one of them is a potential, a new scalar field, phi, with a potential that looks like this. And if you have a potential that's very flat at the bottom, but then goes up like this, then the scalar field can oscillate back and forth. And um, the energy density in that oscillatory motion can behave at late times like this. Um, but um, at the early times, this field will be, remain frozen here. So at early times, this does behave like a cosmological constant. And then at some sufficiently late time, um, the field begins to oscillate and its energy density then is western radiation. Um, another possibility is that you have some slow roll potential. So for example, if you have a potential that looks like this um, you know, straight line that then goes, you know, a ski slope potential that's, you know, it's a line over here, but then becomes flat over here. Then if the field initially takes on some value somewhere over here, it will remain frozen. And then at late times, um, it will reach, it'll, 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 it'll remain, um, it'll roll slowly down here, behave like a cosmological constant. And then at late times, um, it will, its energy density will decay away um, as redshift is a, a scale factor to the minus six. So something like this can also work. So here's a slightly more technical slide. So here's the same plot that I showed you before. Um, this is the actual specification of the oscillating potential that we dealt with, um, one minus cosine phi to the n. Um, once the field begins to oscillate, the equation of state parameter or the energy density is n minus one divided by n plus one. So for example, if um, n is equal to one, then the field decays away like ordinary matter. That's the standard axion potential. If n is equal to two, then um, the energy density decays away as radiation. But if n is greater than two, um, then the energy density decays away faster than radiation. And we tried different values of n. And um, what we did in this paper is actually calculate the cosmic microwave background power spectra. So we modified um, class to include an extra scalar field and to include the oscillations in that scalar field and um, consider the effect of that on the growth of the density perturbations and on the temperature and polarization power spectra. And then we ran a MCMC analysis and what we were able to show is that we, um, what we're able to do is find some combination of the parameters of this potential and the standard cosmological parameters that allowed for a Hubble constant um, in the lower 70s um, and with a fit to the cosmic microwave background data that was just as good as the standard Lambda CDM cosmological model. Um, for those who actually consider cosmological perturbations for a living, there's something called the generalized dark matter formalism that Wayne who um, developed in the late 90s. And it turns out that um, strictly speaking, um, for the analysis, we actually described this oscillating potential in terms of this generalized dark matter formalism. And so strictly speaking, um, the model that we used is not that of an oscillating potential but it's actually of a generalized dark matter component um, that can accurately describe this potential, but it also describes the slow roll potential. So although all the results were presented in terms of, um, you know, were discussed in terms of this oscillating potential, all of the results also apply to slow roll potentials and also to, um, you know, new physics that is parameterized in terms of generalized dark matter rather than any particular scalar field model. Mark, uh, can I ask a question before you proceed to the, to the perturbations? Yep. Yeah, so if, if you can go to the previous slide. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, for for your uh, this axion-like uh, models, your initial field value has to be quite fine-tuned, right? A little bit of uh, up and down would actually uh, create a trouble because you only need about 10% of the That's total right. energy, right? 
so if uh-huh. it's a little if if the field is frozen a little up or a little down the potentia uh, it might create trouble uh, the down would of course not solve hubble problem but the up would actually create a accelerating universe uh, uh, that is right yes um yeah that is correct um yes it is fine tuned um and yes it is a ridiculous model no um, no i didn't mean that i just <laughs> just yeah so well i i said i mean i i i think that it's a ridiculous model um but um it's i don't think this is a i wouldn't call this a theory um i think that uh, the the value of this exercise is to show is is an is an existence proof um yeah, yeah. you know it is possible to on the Lagrangian for you know to consider a new scalar field the right time Lagrangian and find parameters that allow you to um, raise the Hubble value of the Hubble constant um, while simultaneously preserving the astonishingly good fit of the CMB uh, measurements uh, with the CMB measurements. So I have I, there's not a whole lot of detail in the next slide, but basically that's the sentiment of the next two slides. So it turns out that you know making a picture like this is really really easy and coming up with a potential that you know like this or this that gives you this behavior is very very easy um it turns out though to actually see whether this solution works or not is surprisingly difficult and the reason that it's i don't know depends who you are maybe it's easy um it turns out that the the devil is in the details and the reason is that we have exquisitely um precise measurements of the CMB temperature power spectra. We have measurements of the CMB temperature power spectra from L equals two, all the way up to L equals three or 4,000. Um, and those measurements are um, in very good agreement with the standard Lambda CDM model. And anytime you try to muck around with the standard CDM model, you wind up mucking around with those predictions as well. And so typically, if you take the standard lambda CDM model and try to modify it in any way, um, you wind up um, reducing the the fit to the data. And so you have to work pretty hard to actually, you know, go through, you know, and calculate carefully the angular power um, temperature and polarization power spectra from these models. And that's not an easy task. And then you have to go through another difficult task, which is sorting through the parameter space to to find um to find a, a light you know peaks in places in the likelihood places in the parameter space where the likelihood is peaked and so we actually went through and did it and um i was not expecting the result when we first started um because when tanvi and i wrote this paper in 2016 and did sort of um rough estimates of what would happen to the cmb power spectra we were finding we, we, we thought that it would be difficult to find, but when we did more careful calculations, we actually did find regions of the parameter space where things were able to pull together. And so this is the kind of thing that you need to do. Here the data represented is the temperature power spectrum, actually temperature power spectrum residuals relative to the standard lambda CDM model. And the data are in very good agreement with the standard lambda CDM model. Um, and this is the polarization power spectra. And the point is that there's very, very good data and the standard lambda CDM model fits very well. And anything that you do um, has to fit, agree with these very finely measured data. And one of these curves is the, um, the, is the early dark energy curve and the other one is the standard lambda CDM. And you see that they agree quite well over the range of Ls that are measured, but there is some change, some small difference at the higher values of L where the data bars, um, the air bars become larger. And the same is true over here. So here, um, N equals infinity is a dark energy density that decays is A to the minus six at late times. Um, here, N effective is a, I won't talk about that. These are the different early dark energy models. So the standard lambda CDM model will be a perfectly flat line over here. And these different early dark energy models are these different things. And over here where the data are very well fit or very well measured, the models fit, um, but the discrepancies occur 
at um, larger L. And it turns out that um, SPT3G and ACTPOL both now have enough data to measure these power spec with far smaller error bars. And so if early dark energy is the solution, um, we may actually see evidence for that in um, the high L polarization power spectra when SPT and ACT analyze the data they already presumably have. So that is how we're going to test the model. Um, I, that's what Can I you go back to, back to your previous slide? Just have a, so what is delta log B is a base factor or? Uh, yes. Okay. So NS3 is the best? Is that the conclusion based on this? Yeah, that was the conclusion. Uh, it, yeah, it is the best, although it's really not between three and infinity. Yeah. And this, uh, and two is even not so bad. Well, two is worse than lambda CDM if there's a minus sign, slightly worse than lambda CDM if. Yeah, but what I should say is that um, I would not say that, I don't know, Vivian has a different interpretation. I would not say that this provides a better fit than lambda CDM. I would say it provides an equally good fit to lambda CDM. And the N equals two, I mean, depending on, you know, where your threshold is for good fit um, may, this is pretty close. Um, but N equals three and N equals infinity, I say, provide as good a fit to lambda, to the data as lambda CDM. You know, lambda CDM there, um, is consistent with the data. There is no evidence for new physics beyond lambda CDM. And so it's hard to, it's, it's not really possible to say that I have a fit that's better than lambda CDM. The base factor is slightly better, but um, I would just, my interpretation is that it's an equally good fit. Okay. So um, hopefully we will have tests of this scenario um, with data that is in the can and still being analyzed. So hopefully within the next few years, we'll see, we'll have some new um, empirical information. Uh, and that information is gonna come primarily from the polarization power spectra. And the reason is that um, although until now there has been more statistical power in the temperature power spectrum, um, the structure in the polarization actually extends to higher L. And so if you have a high resolution map of the polarization at some point, the statistical information from the polarization, especially for models like this that differ in the high L um, behavior, um, is gonna be more significant. Um, I don't know if you saw the ACT, ACT poll had a data release last few weeks ago, about a month ago, and they had a webinar and they actually said in the webinar, I don't know if they said in the paper that, um, that um, with the new data, the statistical power of the polarization is now about comparable to that from the temperature. And in the future, the statistical power for cosmological parameter determination is gonna come from the polarization. Um, the other thing is, um, suppose this early dark energy does turn out to be what is going on. So suppose the Hubble tension is real and suppose early dark energy is what explains it. Then it's kind of fun to speculate about periods of cosmological constants um, throughout the entire universe. So um, in early dark energy, we have a model where we have some cosmological constant like mat matter at early times, at the late times, its energy density decays away. That is not too dissimilar from what happens in inflation. In inflation, we have a very large cosmological constant that then somehow decays away. Um, we have dark energy today, and some of those models are quintessence models in which the thing that's now a cosmological constant will decay away at late times. And if early dark energy is for real, then there's something that behaves like a cosmological constant intermediate redshift and then decays away. And so it's fun to speculate about whether um, physics and cosmological history involves um, recurring periods of cosmological constant-like behavior. And um, there are things like this that have been considered um, in models with um, a single scalar field with an oscillating potential. Um, but it's also fun to speculate that perhaps this has something to do with the string axiverse. So in some string theories, there is a possibility to have many light scalar fields and it's conceivable 
that different such scalar fields can become dynamically important at different periods in the history of the universe. So that is all I have to say about the Hubble tension. So um, uh, our favorite, question. yep. Uh, so what do you mean by that potential which goes below uh, like negative? Uh, don't take that too seriously. That's a cartoon. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, although people do write those papers, but uh, don't take that too seriously. Okay. Nothing, nothing was implied by the drawing. Okay. Um, a lot of people have been thinking about this kind of thing. As I said, the devil is in the details. So um, it's easy to come up with different models that give you a uh, change in the energy density of the universe that looks more or less like this. Uh, you look at the behavior of the, and the effects on the perturbations carefully um, if a given model is going to succeed to determine whether a given model succeeds or not. Um, and the other thing is it's been uh, interesting, not just for physicists, but also the, the public. Um, this was an article in the New York Times in February 2019. And Dennis Overby, the author of the article at the New York Times, told me that um, they got more comments on this web page on this article than any other science article they've ever had before. So people seem to be interested in the physics. So that's my talk on the Hubble tension, early dark energy. There is this tension between local and early universe values of the Hubble parameter. Um, and it does not seem that it's going to be, that it's not easy to wave away is something wrong with the observations or interpretations. Um, we have proposed an idea that we call early dark energy that seems to work, although um, one should not consider it as anything more than a toy model. I think it's simply an existence proof that it's possible to write down Lagrangian that does the trick without screwing up the um, exquisite be agreement between theory and data in the CMB. Um, there are these measurements of the high L polarization power spectra that will test the hypothesis soon. And if this is how the universe behaves, then it might be interesting to think about recurrent periods of cosmological constant-like behavior throughout the history of the universe. Hi, Mark. Uh, yep. I have an, uh, another question. So uh, how, how much does it solve the, uh, the, the Hubble tension? Uh, let, let's say your model, uh, like, does it completely solve it or? Uh, um, you mean, does it get you the, can you get the value of yeah. uh, H not the degrees of the two for one? Yeah. Um, it depends on your threshold for, um, you know, delta chi squared. Um, we can we can get into the one sigma um, air range of the supernovae to get to the central value of 74 is a little difficult. Um, so it's not the case that you can make um, H arbitrarily large, but you can get it up into the low 70s. All right. Okay. So what about these closed universe models, which I think recently there was an article in Nature by Joe Silk and collaborators that do they also solve this? Uh, I mean, can they at least ameliorate the tensions? I don't think so. We thought about um, closed or open universes, um, but it's it doesn't work out the way that you would think. And um, I mean, I know the paper you're talking about, and I don't remember whether they talked about early dark energy, but we did think about closed and early universes. So if you change the um, universe to a closed universe, then these, um, these straight lines curve slightly in. If you change it to an open universe, then these curved lines straight, curve straight slightly out. So the angle, that you, the, the, the mapping between theta sub s and the physical size is changed. It turns out though, that if you change the geometry, make it an open or closed universe, you have, um, a more, uh, the, there's a more dramatic effect on the angular diameter distance. And so it actually winds up, um, the effect winds up going in the opposite direction. Um, and so if you actually try, you know, to do this exercise, um, you know, um, when you fit um, the data, if you try to fix the Hubble parameter to 70, uh, if you try to allow the, if you, if you, um, fit the Planck, if you fit the CMB data and allow for the geometry of the universe to be a free parameter, um, 
you're actually driven to lower values of the Hubble constant. And I can't remember if it's an open or a closed universe, but the best fit value goes to lower Hubble constants. Thank you. So it actually does not work. Can I ask a question? Yep. Zeliz again. Um, do you have any comments about the series of paper from Colleen Hill and Evan McDonough Hill and collaborators about the large case structure measurements? Oh yeah, good question. Yeah, so recently there were two groups. One was um, Guido D'Amico et al. and the other one was Colin Hill et al. And both of them claim, um, both of them use, um, what is it, um, BOSS data. Um, and they describe the BOSS data using their, an effective field theory description of large scale structure, which allows them to get more information out of um, quasi linear scales than they would otherwise. But that's kind of a size right? um, And they both um, conclude that the data rule out early dark energy. And we have looked at their results and um, we are writing a paper now, a response. We do not agree with their conclusions. Um, so the primary argument is the, the, their interpretation of their, they, 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 they came up with likelihood, um, they, they measured likelihood contours in a multi-dimensional parameter space. And they found that, um, that um, under the null hypothesis, uh, I don't want to get into all the details, um, but we believe that they misinterpreted the results. Um, so they, Roughly speaking, we believe that the conclusion that they came to that early dark energy is ruled out is based on a measure that they put on the early dark energy parameter space and on the fact that um, under the null hypothesis of no dark energy, early dark energy, the early dark energy parameters are not well constrained. Um, so we disagree with our interpretation. The other thing is um, there's some monkey business in the in the um, large scale structure data. The large scale structure data is um, inconsistent with the CMB data, even within the context of the standard Lambda CDM model. And so, so there is an inconsistency that they found between the CMB data and the large scale structure data um, in the early dark energy models. Um, which accounts for the likelihood functions that they came up with. But that same discrepancy also um, exists in the standard Lambda CDM models. Um, so we do not agree with um, their conclusions. Their analysis is fine. We've, uh, we agree with their analysis, we agree with their likelihood contours, but we disagree with the interpretation. And there was another paper by Blake Sherwin that, um, and collaborators that came out a few weeks after their paper and in that paper, they um, do a similar analysis, but they don't use any information from the CMB. And in that analysis, using just large scale structure data, they actually find a best fit value of the Hubble parameter that's um, in the mid 70s. So I think that, I think the, the takeaway message from that paper also is that, um, that um, the large scale structure data do not constrain the Hubble constant um, as quite as precisely as um as the the EFT papers suggest. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does, and I'm looking forward to see the paper. Yeah, the, it's a it's a. I don't have the the graphs with me, but if you if that, we have a simple argument that may, that becomes clear when you look at the plots. I see. Thank you. Um. So the, basically, uh, it becomes clear when we look at the plots, and the papers should come out, hopefully come out soon. But thanks for asking that question, because uh, I know a lot of people have been looking at those and thinking that early dark energy is dead, but I don't, I just don't agree with their interpretation. So um, it's been about an hour. I can either stop and take more questions and more discussion, or I can run through uh, another thing I have prepared to talk about. You can uh, go, people will ask question. Okay. Yeah. okay. So just so you know, I do have, um, somebody supposed to be coming to the house later this afternoon. That was what the phone call was, the repair man. He was calling to tell me they could come earlier. So I asked him to come at the regular time. 
Um, but if the phone might call, it's a, I, I might have to leave promptly. Uh, hi, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So, I mean, uh, uh, I I don't know if I missed it or not, but uh, like uh, a differing uh, dark energy, uh, you know, dark energy involvement is one of the factors that is causing this, uh, you know, uh, the Hubble tension. I mean, uh, how many other factors have you considered that could lead to this apart from the dark energy difference? What do you mean? You clarify, can you say, ask I think a, he's asking yeah. other models, right? Oh, yes. um, so here's a, here's a brief list of other early modifications to early universe physics. So these are all, um, I would say, early time solutions to the Hubble tension. Basically for the same thing. Um, they are all basically new physics to increase the expansion rate of a Fourier combination. And um, in mm. each case, um, you know, to actually figure out whether it's consistent with the data or not requires that you actually do the, you know, very careful analysis of the CMB data. And some of them work quite well. The so rock and roll solutions to the Hubble tension are very, very similar to what we um, considered over here. Um, there's a very nice paper by Lynn et al. Um, that's um, considered a, the, a bunch of slow roll potentials as well as oscillating potentials. So they sort of, um, I think the, what I really liked about that paper is that they fleshed out this cartoon very carefully. Okay. Um, there's some papers that involve, um, you know, neutrinos or different gravity, alternative gravity to um, change the early expansion history. But so, uh, I mean, uh, like if you could tell, I mean, uh, which of these uh, approaches provided, you know, the most significant evidence towards solving this issue? Uh, is there any? I don't think so. I don't think there's enough statistical information. I think there's, I don't think there's enough statistical power in the data yet to okay. point to one or the other. Some of them are cl clearly inconsistent, um, but I don't think that any of them work. The ones that are consistent, I don't, of the ones that are not inconsistent, I don't think you can say that any work better than others. Uh, um, what about any uh, modifications to dark matter? I think most of these are either dark energy or this thing. I think, uh, uh, what about, uh, I think it's any funky dark matter models. Which... Um, that's a little, that's an interesting question. I'm guessing that it's trickier to pull off. And the reason that it's probably trickier to pull off is that um, we know from the detailed shape of the CMB power spectra that um, dark matter was behaving very much like collisionless matter, collisionless pressureless matter um, it redshifts all the way up to 10 to the five or 10 to the six. Um, and so I think that it would be, I'm not saying it's impossible. I think it would be difficult to find a solution that actually um, gives you consistency with the CMB power spectra. The advantage of um, the dark energy is that at early times over here, it's just doing nothing. Whereas if you were to modify dark matter, you'd be changing physics at these early times. And this physics, the properties of dark matter and the energy density of dark matter at redshifts all the way up to almost 10 to the six are constrained um, by the high L data and the CMB power spectrum. So it might be worth thinking about, but I'm guessing it's gonna be hard. I think Nikodem Poplavsky has his hand up. I don't know if yeah. maybe he wants to. Nikodem Poplavsky here. Uh, so uh, I was talking to David Spergo two years ago at Columbia University uh, workshop, and he said, I asked him the question, can we modify dark matter uh, equation of state, uh, which could possibly solve the uh, Hubble discrepancy? And he said that uh, a tiny negative pressure of dark matter uh, would be consistent with uh, the constraints from CMB. And actually, uh, I believe little negative pressure of dark matter could solve the high, uh, Hubble discrepancy. 
Is that a, from the late time, uh, late times or early times? Oh, I uh, don't quite remember, but I, I know that like basically like if you, uh, if, uh, if the equation of state of dark matter uh, um, for, uh, between the last scattering time to now, uh, if, if it's modified and if we abandon uh, the ratio of pressure to dark energy is assumed to be zero, but if it's like approximately minus 0 0.01, then uh, this could solve. Yeah, I think, I think that boils down to this type of solution. Uh -huh. um, essentially, you're making the ordinary, the contribution of ordinary matter at intermediate redshifts yes. be a little smaller than it would be otherwise. But I think that that's going to run into the same problem with um, the baryon acoustic oscillations. I think I see. Um, so, and I think that's been become appreciated over the past two years. So, it's a weird problem. If it was the other way around, we would just say it's quintessence and <clears throat> and Adam Reese would get a second Nobel Prize. But, um, you know, given that the CMB value is less than the local value, that's harder to explain. So I can tell you briefly about some recent things I've been doing that are completely different. Um, and the basic idea is the basic theme is chirality in cosmology and the basic motivation. Um, this is a, a su subject I've been thinking about for a long time on and off. Um, the electroweak interactions are parity breaking. We have left-handed neutrinos, but not right-handed neutrinos and the Z bosons couple only to the left-handed components of all the leptons and quarks, but not the right-handed. Um, and we have dark energy, inflation, dark matter, and baryogenesis problems in cosmology. We don't know what any of these are, but we postulate new physics to account. Well, all of them are going to require new physics. And we all hope that, you know, new physics um, is unified at some ultra high energy scale. And so it's reasonable to ask whether there might be parity breaking that's manifest elsewhere in new physics and in particular in new cosmological physics. So, I'm going to just give you a brief rundown of some recent things I've been thinking about. Not a whole lot of um, detail, um, but the basic things I want you to take away are that some of the papers that I've been working on recently I'm proud of because they have some elegant mathematics. Um, some of them provide proofs of principle, even if the, um, the predictions are not verifiable. Uh, but there are also some new observables that we've been able to think of that might be of interest or uh, worth looking for with um, forthcoming measurements. So we've been thinking about the circular polarization of the cosmic microwave background from density perturbations and from gravitational waves and from chiral gravitational waves. We've been thinking about chiral gravitational waves and how you might probe them with pulsar timing arrays and astrometry surveys and also some recent work on 21 centimeter polarization. Uh, my collaborators are Keizuke Inamata, who's going to Chicago as a postdoc this fall. Um, my, the PTA work has been done with Salim Hotinli, Kim Badi, Wenzer Chin, Liang Dai, Andrew Jaffe, and Ennis Elgasem. And the 21 centimeter work has been done with Ling Guanji and Keizuke Inamata. And all of this work um, uses tools developed, mathematical tools developed in this total angular momentum formalism um, in 2012 with Liang Dai and Dong Gui Zhang. So we've all heard quite a bit about the cosmic microwave background, but almost all the work that we've heard about involves descriptions of the temperature fluctuations or the linear polarization. Now the photons in the cosmic microwave background are linearly polarized because the photons um, were last scattered by electrons. And if an electron sees an anisotropic incident radiation field, then the scattered radiation becomes linearly polarized. So that's why the CMB is linearly polarized. However, um, light can be circularly polarized as well as linearly polarized. Um, but the CMB is not circularly polarized at linear order in cosmological perturbations. 
It turns out, though, that um, Sawyer in 2014 showed, and Montero, Camacho, and Harata provided a much more um, detailed calculation in 2018, that circular polarization polarization arises at second order from photon-photon interactions in the standard cosmological model. And the reason is that um, in quantum electrodynamics, to order alpha squared in the fine structure constant alpha, the um, Lagrangian for electromagnetism, which classically is one half e squared minus b squared, gets augmented by the addition of a term that's higher order and actually a fourth order in electric and magnetic fields. And so what this describes is a photon-photon interaction that is induced by electron-positron loops. So um, this Lagrangian allows you to calculate the cross-section for um, elastic scattering of a photon from a photon these people showed is that if one of these photons is the cosmic microwave background photon that you're looking at, and the other photon is taken to be the bath of, cosmic, of all the other cosmic microwave background photons that this photon passes through, then you can get a circular polarization. And roughly speaking, the reason is that the um, radiation field, the cosmic microwave background radiation field that any given photon sees is anisotropic for the same reason that the photon field that we see is anisotropic. And that gives rise to an anisotropic birefringence as that photon passes. So as that photon comes to us from the surface of last scatter, um, the propagation speed for photons that are linearly polarized in this direction might be different, the linearly polarized in this direction might be different than those that are linearly polarized in this direction. So this is a straightforward effect that can be calculated and they, the paper by Montero Camacho is very impressive and very nice. And so this um, circular polarization can arise in linear order through interaction of the cosmic microwave, the linear, linearly polarized cosmic microwave background photon as it propagates at late times through the anisotropic cosmic microwave background field. And here to give you a flavor of the uh, papers are some equations. The linear polarization is described, the linear polarization of the cosmic microwave background in some direction on the sky hat n is described in terms of Stokes parameters q and u, which are components of a symmetric trace-free two by two polarization tensor PAB, and this is a tensor that lives on the two-sphere, on the surface of the sky, the celestial sphere. The cosmic birefringence due to this photon-photon interaction is described by another symmetric trace-free tensor, one that involves as its components phi q and phi u. And phi q is the phase delay that a photon with a q polarization experiences, and phi u is the phase delay that a photon with the u polarization experiences. So those two phase delays are equal to an integral along the line of sight of the index of refraction for the q parameter, the q component, and the u component. And then the circular polarization turns out to be a tensorial analog of a cross product. So it has to involve the linear polarization some interaction of the linear polarization tensor with the phase delay tensor. And the only scalar, pseudo-scalar, that you can construct from these two tensors is this one over here. So here, epsilon AC is the anti-symmetric tensor, and it's clear that you have to have an anti-symmetric tensor in there because V, the circular polarization, is a pseudo-scalar under parity inversion, it changes sign. And so you want to have this observable on the right, this uh, V, be a uh, parity odd, and that is accomplished by including this epsilon over here. So this is the only pseudo-scalar that you can construct from PAB and phi, and this turns out to be what the circular polarization is. So <clears throat> once you recognize that, it is fairly straightforward to calculate the circular polarization power spectrum. 
So we expand the circular polarization in terms of its spherical harmonic coefficients. And if V is a function of N is this, then the spherical harmonic coefficients turn out to be some sum over the spherical harmonic coefficients for the polarization and for the phase delay tensor. If we have only primordial density perturbations, then the polarization tensor is composed only of E modes. There are no B modes. And similarly for the phase delay tensor, density perturbations cannot produce a B mode contribution. And then the spherical tensors for the circular polarization turn out to be this thing over here. You sum over the, the, the spherical harmonic coefficients for the polarization for the phase delay tensor. And then there's an integral over the product of these three um, spherical harmonics, these two E mode tensor spherical harmonics and the scalar spherical harmonic. And it's straight, there's some straightforward algebra, but the power spectrum for the polar, circular polarization turns out to be this, where this is the polarization, ang, linear polarization angular power spectrum. This is the angular power spectrum from the phase delay tensor. And these are angular power spectra, the, the cross power spectrum between the polarization and the delay tensor. And if the phase delay tensor phi and the polarization were lined up, then the circular polarization would be zero. The cross product of two tensors that are aligned in the same way is zero. And that um, is consistent with this result over here. If the polarization and the phase delay were perfectly correlated, then this difference would be zero. And this here is just something that the, this is a, essentially a, a, a Wigner 3J symbol, more or less. So that is the result. And it turns out that um, we were able to derive using this total angular momentum formalism, we we're able to re-derive um, this result um, far more elegantly than um, in prior work that used the standard, um, the standard approach based on um, Fourier analysis and plane waves for density perturbations. Um, in subsequent work, another paper, we um, expanded the analysis to primordial gravitational waves. So if we have primordial gravitational waves, they can contribute to the linear polarization and to the phase delay tensor. Now, if they're gravitational waves, then both the polarization and the phase delay tensor can now have B mode components. And so you wind up getting some more complicated expression. Um, the expression itself is not of interest, except just to show that you know, we can write it in one page. Again, if you look at prior work, um, the expressions, prior work that used um, the standard approach to perturbations based on Fourier analysis um, were far, far more cumbersome. Um, these turn out to be fairly academic exercises because if you actually calculate the amplitude of the circular polarization, um, the numbers turn out to be, you know, eight or more orders of magnitude smaller than what can be detected now. So this is never going to be measured. Um, but it's academically, it's, you know, it's intellectually interesting. Um, one of the interesting things that we found, though, is that this mechanism allows you to convert the chirality or imprint the chirality of a primordial gravitational wave background onto the chirality of the photons. So let's suppose that for some reason, inflation produced gravitational waves, and for some other reason, those gravitational waves were parity breaking. So suppose there were more right-handed gravitational waves than left-handed gravitational waves. What we were able to show is that this photon-photon interaction in that case would give rise to a circular polarization for a, an average or mean circular polarization for the cosmic microwave background. So V00 here is the L equals zero, M equals zero component of the spherical, of the circular polarization. So this is the prediction for the circular polarization of the cosmic microwave background that you would obtain after averaging over all directions on the sky. So basically this is the difference in the number of right circularly polarized photons versus left circularly polarized photons. Of course, in the standard model, there is no asymmetry. So the standard model, this expectation value is zero. But what we were able to show is that if you have a chiral gravitational wave background, 
then this can be non-zero. Here, delta chi parameterizes the chirality of the gravitational wave background. So it's zero for a chiral gravitational wave background. And R is the amplitude of the gravitational wave background, the tensor to, sp scalars, um, the tensor -to scalar ratio in units of 0 0.06, the maximum value it can have um, according to current measurements. And so we're able to show that there is a prediction that if there's a chiral gravitational wave background, cosmic microwave background should have a preferred handedness as well. Another thing that was interesting though is that suppose there, was, there were gravitational waves, but delta chi was zero. So it was a non-chiral gravitational wave background. In that case, the expectation value for the circular polarization would be zero, but what we showed is that the variance in that prediction is non-zero. And the interpretation is, when we look at the circular polarization of the CMB, the prediction for that circular polarization depends um, on the, gravita the, the gravitational wave background in our observable universe. And in particular, it is determined by long wavelength gravitational waves. Um, and in particular, in our observable horizon, there might be, say, a border 100 gravitational wave modes that are actually significant for determining V00. And even if the gravitational wave background is um, not chiral, within any given observable volume, half of the gravitational waves, 50 of them are expected to be right-handed and 50 are expected to be left-handed. But in any given observable region, um, we won't have 50 and 50, the number will fluctuate up or down. So even if the expectation value is 50 right-handed and 50 left-handed, um, in our observable volume, it's conceivable that a statistical fluctuation will give us 55 left-handed gravitational waves and 45 right-handed gravitational waves. So it turns out that even if there's a gravitational wave background that is not chiral, there's a possibility that we would see, or even an expectation that we would see a circular polarization, a net circular polarization in the cosmic microwave background. And only if the net circular polarization exceeded that RMS, circular polarization that you expect from this cosmic variance, could you infer that the gravitational wave background was actually chiral. Again, this is all academic because we're 10 orders of magnitude from detectability, but um, it's kind of an interesting discovery, theoretical discovery. We have also been thinking about um, applying our total angular momentum formalism to pulsar timing arrays and gravitational waves. So pulsar timing arrays are um, efforts to detect gravitational waves with frequencies in the nanohertz regimes. So frequencies on, or periods on order of weeks to months to years. And the idea is if I look at a whole bunch of different pulsars and there's a gravitational wave propagating through the universe, then there will be a redshift a distortion to the arrival times of pulses from these different pulsars. So some of them will be advanced in terms of arrival times and some of them will be delayed. And by comparing the arrival times of pulses from all these different pulsars, you can look for a gravitational wave distortion to the space time. Um, this is not just theoretical, this is uh, an active observational field. Um, this is a prediction for the stochastic gravitational wave background that we expect from mergers of supermassive black holes. And already the measurements are digging into the predicted parameter space and um, future measurements you know, on the decade time scale should get down by about two orders of magnitude. So this is what we're looking at over here. And given the time, I'm not gonna go through in detail. So I'm just going to advertise the work rather than, than explain it. Um, if you look at the calculations of the angular correlations in pulse arrival times in, um, generated by gravitational waves, you will find papers with very, very, very long equations and derivations that go on for pages and pages. And it turns out that um, this calculation is the killer app for this total angular momentum formalism that Zhang, Dai, and I developed in 2012. 
And um, it turns out that with this formalism, we can rederive the fundamental result of those analyses, the so-called Helling's Downs curves, so Helling's Down curve, um, in essentially just a handful of lines. Um, with and uh, it turns out that the angular correlation function for the um, pulse arrival times as a function of the angular separation theta between the two pulsars being correlated um, takes on the simple form where x is this cosine theta. And we can derive this result essentially in three lines by using the total angular momentum formalism. Um, there's also a possibility that you could look for angular shifts in the pulse uh, in the positions of stars. So if I have gravitational waves, it will not only affect the arrival time of pulses, it will also deflect these pulsars or any stars um, on the sky, the positions, the apparent positions of these um, stars on the sky. And so people talking are talking about doing this, and this is a simulation of those deflection angles as a function of position on the sky. Um, if there's a gravitational wave passing through, and again, the same formalism, the total angular momentum formalism allows us to um, uh, re-derive all the same results that people derived in the past with far less algebraic value. And, and um, I'll just show you the results. So <clears throat> we are able to summarize in this one equation, the results for the angular power spectrum for the uh, power spectra for the pulsar, um, redshift delay, and also for the E and B modes for the angular deflection um, in pulsar in, uh, in astrometry surveys. Um, for a gravitational wave polarization alpha. So in general relativity, there are two gravitational wave polarizations, plus or cross, but in our formalism, we call them TE and TB. And in alternative gravity theories, there can be up to four more gravitational wave polarizations, two vector modes and two different scalar modes. And we can calculate the power spectrum and cross power spectra for any of those polarization modes in terms of the simple formula over here, where F is a window function um, for X prime for the different, where X prime is redshift or E or B for the astrometry survey, and alpha is one of the six polarizations. And these Fs turn out to be very simple and are presented in this table over here. And again, um, in this one table, we summarize um, results that have been presented in tons of different papers using far more cumbersome algebraic derivations that go on for pages and pages. So, um, there's not a whole lot of new physics here, but it turns out that this total angular momentum formalism um, is very powerful for this, part, this particular application. Um, <clears throat> we've also written papers on gravitational wave anisotropy. So um, we've been able to show using these types of tools how it is that you would take the measurements of pulsar, pulse, um, pulsar, pulse arrival times for pulsar spread throughout the sky and then determine um, if that, if those gravitational wave, the gravitational wave background was isotropic or not. So this is a parameterization of a gravitational wave background that can be anisotropic. So if the gravitational wave background is isotropic, then all of these Gs will be zero. This is a description of anisotropies in the gravitational wave background in terms of spherical harmonic coefficients, GLM. And we were able to show um, how it is that you would measure these GLMs from those pulse arrival times. Uh, <clears throat> again, there's equations, but that's the basic signal. Um, what we find is that um, there is a possibility to detect anisotropy in the gravitational wave background, although that anisotropy has to be fairly large. Uh, but it is conceivable that it could be a large anisotropy because if the signal, local signal is dominated by a single supermassive black hole binary nearby, it'll be highly anisotropic. Um, we've also been able to show how you use these types of tools or modify these tools to look for anisotropy in the circular polarization of the gravitational wave background. So again, um, if I have a circular a gravitational wave background that is circularly polarized, described in terms of um, spherical harmonic coefficients epsilon LM, 
there's a straightforward algorithm that we've been able to write down for measuring these um, L epsilon LMs from the pulsar timing array data. Um, and again, this is interesting because the um, expected sources are supermassive black hole binary mergers and generically the gravitational wave signals from supermassive black hole binary mergers should be circularly polarized. And finally, in um, a recent paper that has been completed, um, this is no longer in progress, um, this appeared on the archive about a month ago, we've been able to also describe circular polarization of the 21 centimeter radiation from the dark ages. Um, <clears throat> so again, um, at linear order in standard cosmological perturbations, 21 centimeter radiation from neutral hydrogen in the dark ages is not expected to be circularly polarized. But um, if there is a density perturbation, that will induce quadru um, distortions in the last scattering surface. Um, and so the cosmic microwave background that any given hydrogen atom sees will be anisotropic. But the 21 centimeter radiation incident on that neutral atom will also be anisotropic. Um, because of um, density perturbations on smaller scales. And so there'll be a spin quadrupole in the neutral hydrogen that's induced by anisotropies in the 21 centimeter radiation from nearby structures that can interact with the intensity quadrupole from the cosmic microwave background that comes from larger distances. And if those two quadrupole moments are misaligned as they in general should be, then um, there will be a circular polarization. And again, the only, um, the, let's see, the temperature, CMB temperature quadrupole moment is described by a rank two tensor TCD. The spin polar is, sorry, the, 20, the um, intensity of the 21 centimeter radiation is described by some other tensor gamma BD. And if we look in a direction hat NA on the sky, the only, um, uh, the only pseudo-scalar that you can construct from these two tensors and from the specter is this. And this actually turns out to be the answer when you do the calculation precisely. And so there's an expression for the circular polarization that we can write down in terms of these anisotrop anis anis anisotropy tensors. And once you make this um, observation, uh, you're able to rederive prior results in terms of this total length with the total length momentum formalism in a much more simple and elegant way. And that's the point of the paper. Um, and we have results. So numerically, the circular polarization power spectrum for the 21 centimeter radiation can be calculated. And it depends on the observer frequency and different observer frequencies probe different um, redshifts, different periods in the history of the universe. And so we've provided these results. And the takeaway message here is that this circular polarization is actually not that ridiculously small and is conceivably accessible with, you know, a next, next generation 21 centimeter um, measurement. So it's futuristic, but not ridiculously futuristic. Um, we have not yet looked at cross correlations of the signal with other observables, but that should be interesting to do so. And so I think I'll just summarize here. So here I didn't explain a whole lot, but was simply really more or less advertising some recent things that we've been thinking about um, that involve chirality and cosmology and um, that implement tools from this total angular momentum formalism that uh, we developed eight years ago. So I told you about work on CMB circular polarization. Um, I told you that gravitational waves, if they have a chirality, then that chirality can be imprinted on the cosmic microwave background circular, circular polarization, although that um, is basically a proof of principle given that the result is many orders of magnitude smaller than can ever be measured. Um, <clears throat> we've also used this total angular momentum formalism, applied it to calculations of observables for PTA and astrometry probes of the gravitational wave background. These are actual measurements of, that people are making of um, trying to seek 
um, gravitational wave um, gravitational waves that are expected from supermassive black hole mine, by mergers. And so this is actually work that's relevant for you know traditional astrophysical sources that people are looking for, not just for exotic new physics. And we've also shown how you can calculate the circular polarization of 21 centimeter radiation um, using um, these mathematical tools that again are very well matched to this particular calculation. So are there any questions, comments, complaints? So, uh, uh, Mark, thank you very much for your nice elaborative talk and uh, like we get to know a lot of thing uh, from your talk. Now people can ask question. I, I, I can see that uh, uh, someone have uh, raised the hand. Please ask the question. Unmute yourself and ask the question. Ask. Yeah, yeah, please. Ask. Okay, so so this uh, about the second part of the talk. This is Shantanu again. Uh, so this uh, this uh, formalism, TM formalism. You can rederive the Helling's down curve, but can it also help in the data analysis of the for people who are looking for nano and gravitation waves? Uh, can it help sort of ex uh, can can it help the data analysis? Of the people, uh, uh, or is this just to rederive uh, the headings down curve? Um, so it turns out that um, that's a good question. Um, so I'm looking at this table because this is um, all the results from that you get not just only from standard gravitational waves, but also from all the other four possible circular polarizations that you might have an alternative gravity. And it's for all of the power spectra and cross power spectra. And I think that, um, so these, this is the, this is the result for the standard Helling's down curve right here, this one entry over here. So this was just a re-derivation of something that's been known for, you know, 30 or 40 years. Um, these two were re-derivations of results that um, Book and Flanagan had derived about a decade or half a decade before. Um, all the rest here were um, somewhat new-ish. I think um, other people derived um, derived all these results um, using alternate other formalisms, but they didn't derive them in power spectrum space. They divide in, in order in harmonic space. Um, these results were all derived about the same time as us in configuration space. Some were derived a bit earlier. Um, the thing is that um, when you can rederive a result um, with an alternative formalism in a much more simple way, it often pro provides intuition and insight. And there are lots of insights that we were able to obtain with this formalism. So in particular, we we're able to show that there is a perfect correlation between the astrometry observables and the pulsar timing arrays. Um, so if you were actually to know the, the pulsar timing um, residuals as a function of position in the sky, you would be able to predict exactly what the astrometry observables were. Um, it also was able to show you that the angular correlations um, are due only in, um, due to standard gravitational waves are due only to um, an E mode. There is no B mode contribution to the redshift residuals. Um, so, in some sense, with um, pulsar timing rays, you can only get half of the information about the gravitational wave background. Um, so, there are a bunch of insights that we're able to, and we're also able to understand things. Um, it had been seen um, that the, the um, observable redshift for scalar. For, uh, for scalar gravitational waves diverge logarithmically with the um, observed with the source distance, which does not happen with any of the other sources. And again, we're able to understand this in a simple um, physical way with the total angular momentum formalism. So it's not so much that there was much new or that wasn't known from other ways, but um, there was a lot of intuition about some of the results that were kind of mysterious from the, from the, st the standard calculation.
In terms of data analysis, I don't know that it provides much um, because the data analysis is likely most is um, going to be done most likely in configuration space rather than harmonic space. Um, so I don't know that there's much value there. Although the the business about circular polarization, um, I think these observables for the circular polarization, I believe that these are new. And we have not yet gone through all the steps required to make this um, a useful tool for observations. We have to convert our harmonic space results to configuration space results, but um, I think that this is actually new. Okay, thank you. Um, I have one question regarding uh, this uh, TM formalism. So like maybe not uh, observationally very relevant, but I'm just asking from the theoretical perspective, have anybody like you or somebody have derived anything about three point function? Say that again? Oh, write anything about three point functions? Yeah. Yes, that is actually an excellent question. That was the motivation. Yeah, so because why I have asked the question, because dealing with uh, the three point function from other perspective, like the primordial and mostly talking about. So there are like uh, many certainties from different, different formalisms people have. Probably we have it that uh, in 2012, uh, you have written to me regarding this issue because I usually do the three point function calculations. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so, so I, I can remember. <laughs> so this, this approach is, is tailor made for, for three point functions, especially if you have, um, you're dealing with vector or tensor perturbations. Yeah. Uh, the way this happened is, um, Leon Dai was a, a new graduate student, and um, I suggested some calculation to him um, of the cosmic involved the. Uh, some three point observables in the cosmic microwave background. Mm -hmm. And he's very, very good. And he came back to me with um, this calculation that had all these Wigner 3J signal symbols and 6J symbols and 9J symbols. Yeah, I know. It would be it. Yeah. And, um, but then the final result was depended just on, but, uh, you know, the final result depend on one Wigner 3J symbol. And I was teaching gradual level quantum mechanics at the time, and I was teaching the wigner eckert theorem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I realized that, you know, the wigner eckert theorem tells us that if we have a statistically isotropic, you know, if there's no preferred direction, then any three-point correlation function can yeah. only depend on the three-point function. And it turns out that what happens is that those six, those Wigner 6J symbols and 9J symbols were showing up because if I'm doing a three point function, you know, one, two, three, but this is a tensor mode, then that tensor mode involves an orbital angular momentum and a spinning angular momentum. And then if this is a tensor mode, each of these is a tensor mode, each of these has a, you know, a, an orbital angular momentum and a spinning angular momentum. So instead of adding three angular momenta, you're adding six angular momenta. And that's why things get really complicated. But if you understand the Wigner 3J symbol, you can um, you know, describe a tensor or a vector perturbation, not in terms of a spin and normal angle momentum, but in terms of a total angle momentum. True. And so each one of these modes is now described in terms of one total angle momentum state. And then if I take three total angle momentum waves, the three point correlation function can only depend on a Wigner 3J symbol. And so we wrote two papers back in 2012 and the second paper actually provided um, all the tools that you need to calculate any three-point correlation function for any combination of vector and tensor modes. Actually, it wasn't, we didn't do all of them, all of them, but we did most and it should be clear. Yeah, like, uh, you have actually asked me about the cross correlations. Uh, cross correlations of what with what? Like uh, scalar vector, kind of scalar vector vector or scalar tensor tensor kind of. Yeah. 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 So anything, yeah, if you just have, yeah, I don't remember exactly what we were talking about, but um, yeah, you can. Uh, yeah, it's, I can it's a, it's a, drive that email again. <laughs> if, if you're writing a paper with three point functions and you have a Wigner 6J symbol or 9J symbol, you should go back and read our paper. It's a really long and complicated paper. It no, takes a lot of work, but it's actually, no, once you. Really, 
but it was i had to say it was really well written paper because everything can be understood from that uh, so that's why i particularly raised this question uh, and one more thing just to uh, like uh, ask i just forgot so if you just include this anisotropic part which you have actually pointed here so what is the contribution in the three point function how it looks like there of the an oh you mean for the pulsar timing arrays yeah 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 um, so that's actually a little different. Strictly speaking, that does not involve total angular momentum waves. So strictly speaking, what happens is, um, so these ZLMs are, so Z is the pulsar timing, um, the, the, what's it called? The, the timing residual, the, the, the pulse delay induced by the gravitational wave. Mm -hmm. And DLM is the spherical harmonic coefficient for it. So the two-point angular correlation function, if I have an isotropic background, has only this um, contribution here. Okay. If I have statistical isotropy, these different um, spherical harmonic coefficients are uncorrelated. And so there's just this angular power spectrum C sub L. But now suppose the background is anisotropic and the anisotropy is described in terms of a spherical, some spherical harmonic coefficient, GLM. Then, in the tropic background, then that can induce correlations between different spherical harmonic coefficients. And those different correlation, the, the cor those correlations are described in terms of um, bipolar spherical harmonics. Um, the, for the amplitudes, um, weighted by a Klebsch-Gordon coefficient. True. So, you know, if, if I only have a quadrupole moment, so suppose the only non-zero G is L equals two and capital M equals zero, then the correlations between z the different CLMs is gonna be given, is gonna be proportional to this Klebsch-Gordon coefficient. Okay, okay. Yeah. But like uh, determining the structure of all the Klebs Gordon coefficients for all L and all in analytically is possible? Uh, yeah. Okay. So the, the prediction is this bipolar spherical harmonic. So this um, generalizes the power spectrum to the case where we have anisotropy. Oh, okay. And there's the formula. So if you say that, you know, if you give me GLM, then the bipolar spherical harmonic is just this. And this H is, I don't know if I wrote it down. The H is a, essentially a, 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 a Wigner 3J symbol. Yeah. And okay. I is just um, proportional to the amplitude of the gravitational wave background. Oh, okay. So it turns out to be very simple. And the Z sub L is, um, L minus two factorial over L plus two factorial. It's a very simple expression. Yeah. Okay. And uh, like uh, when we talk about the primordial perturbations, like not I'm talking about CMB inflation. We don't care about vector modes, but here we can because those contributions are non-zero. Okay, so like you consider, so so what are the predictions coming from this kind of calculation? The non-zero results they you obtain. I'm uh, asking observational perspective. Ah, uh, so what we pre um. What do we predict? We didn't predict anything in this particular paper. Um, I didn't write it down here, but we wrote down an estimator for the GLM. So if you give me the data from a pulsar timing array, which is going to be pulse arrival times mm -hmm. um, for pulsars spread throughout the sky, um, I have an estimator for these GLMs. This is an expression for the noise that I can measure each GLM. 
So I plug into my the formula for the estimator, which I don't have in these slides. And if it's bigger than the variance, then I've discovered an anisotropy. Okay. So that's so the the product of this is a a, a straightforward algorithm um, that allows me to take the data and look for anisotropy in the gravitational wave background. Okay. Okay, so uh, other people can ask also questions. I may ask uh, you in email about this calculation. Sure. Yeah. So uh, yeah, other people please ask a question if you have anything. Everybody is silent. I hope everybody is very tired. <laughs> 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 okay, I think uh, if there is no question, so only one request, please unmute yourself and give, give a clap for Mark for giving such a nice talk. So please do that. Great. Okay, and thank you all for... Uh, thank you. Thanks for a nice talk. talk. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Shayantan, for organizing this also. So. Okay, so just uh, those who are attending frequently, our next speaker is Alex Vilenkin, and then next day speaker is Sean Carroll. So I, I would request everybody to be uh, the part of all those talks. Because uh, sorry, uh, I, I understand that it is already late with club, but uh, I have a very quick question in case if it is allowed. I am Purnendu. Yeah, yeah, please. Why you are asking at the late when I... <laughs> no, I was just thinking there are some more important questions than this. So, please ask. Uh, all right. So, um, uh, all the things uh, we have, I mean, you have discussed here today are uh, involved uh, uh, Lambda CDM or some other model on the best on metric. So, uh -huh. um, now I am, I'm just thinking that since uh, all the discrepancy or all the... Um, problematic things are happening due to this uh, either lambda CDM or metric based modified theory. Uh, yeah. Are you by chance considering that maybe we should look at some further geometrical representation of gravity so that uh, um, we could uh, explore a bit more uh, uh, or it is more uh, hypothetical to think in this direction? Yeah, I'm a uh... Always in favor of thinking of new ideas. That's the hardest part of this. <laughs> I don't have any myself, though. So. Uh, okay, so if I if further geometrical representation, can you please elaborate? I oh, sure. Um, uh, so, for example, um, uh, if you add a torsion and non metricity oh, okay, on the top okay. of the okay. uh, metric uh, theory, yeah. because all the things are happening due to the H. I mean. Uh, the fundamental ingredients of H naught is the um, scale factor, and it is associated to the metric. And uh, it looks like uh, yep, everything's up for grabs. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I'm, I'm just uh, asking the question for your opinion. That have you thought of in that direction, or it is uh, too abstract or too hypothetical to? Um, uh, I have very lim uh, have finite time and infinite number of ideas. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Just haven't thought about it. I don't okay, have any... Thank you very much. Okay. I got to run off. I thank you very much. Stay safe, healthy. This is the most important thing. And uh, yeah, so and thank you very much for your time. And like, I will be in touch with you uh, anyways. So, good. and uh, like, things will be. I'm very hopeful that it will be better very soon. And uh, yeah, like someday we can meet in person. In person. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Not virtually. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Okay, Mark, you will be a little bit big, but I'm requesting the other participants to lift. Ah, okay. <laughs>